Shalom from Jerusalem. Um, good evening or good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jane. I work at the International School for Holocaust Studies and I'm here to welcome you all to the second part of a special three-part series touring the beautiful and meaningful Yad Vashem campus in Jerusalem. And we know how many of you would like to be able to visit here in person at the moment, so these tours are designed to bring you closer while all these limitations remain in place. Tonight, your tour guide will be Orit Margaliot, who some of you may have had the privilege of learning from before. Last week, my colleague Noam Gittin walked you around the campus while examining the themes of heroism and resistance. And next week, for the third part, my colleague Hayley Dillman will guide you through ethical dilemmas in rescue. But before we begin, it is important to note that this special series is dedicated to the memory of Sheldon Adelson, Zichronol Livracha, who together with his wife Miri have been named the patrons of the Mountain Remembrance. Yad Vashem has been blessed with their generous support since the early 1990s. Sheldon was born in Boston, Massachusetts to Jewish immigrant parents and enlisted in the US military. Once discharged, he began to seek his fortune in the business world, working as a mortgage broker, investment advisor and financial consultant to great success. Dr. Miriam Adelson was born and raised in Israel. Her parents, Manucha and Simcha Falbstein, left Poland before the Shoah, while unfortunately many of their family members did not share the same fate and were all murdered in Europe. As such, we're dedicating these tours to the late Sheldon, who sadly passed away just a few weeks ago on January 11th, aged 87. It seems very fitting that these tours are being provided by the dedicated staffers of the International School for Holocaust Studies, being as Holocaust education was a cause so very close to his heart. Thanks to his and Miri's ongoing partnership, Yad Vashem's professional training in Holocaust education has been to flourish and be adapted and disseminated for hundreds of thousands of teachers across six continents and in multiple languages. We've trained teachers to educate about the Holocaust in over 60 countries now over the years, thanks to the Adelson's vision, understanding how only comprehensive study of Shoah history will be able to serve to impact generations of students, even and especially in countries far removed from where it took place. And we continue to do this in Sheldon Adelson's memory and as a tribute to his enduring legacy. Tonight's tour will focus upon Israeli collective memory in the wake of the Holocaust. To examine this, you will be guided through different facets of our beautiful Jerusalem campus, including the Hall of Remembrance, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Memorial, the Partisans Monument, the Children's Memorial and others, but I won't give too much away, not to spoil it for Orit. And now to introduce you to your guide for this evening. Orit Margaliot has been at Yad Vashem for over 20 years. At the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, she studied art history and Holocaust history. She's been working at the International School for Holocaust Studies since 2000, and she's been responsible for the desks of several countries in the European department and also Australia at one point. For 13 years, she was the head of the Polish desk in the European department, and she actually speaks Polish fluently. You can test her. Orit was in charge of the development of educational components for the Shoah exhibit that is, has been developed by Yad Vashem at Block 27 at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. Currently, She's the head of the training and curriculum department in the educational guiding department. And she's also the expert staff of Yad Vashem's special program to train Israeli guys to take groups to Poland. As her colleague and her friend, I can also personally add that Dorit is a perfect for this particular tour as she brings so many thought provoking angles and viewpoints. So even if you visited these monuments in the past, I promise you, you'll learn something new this evening. Thank you all, wishing you a meaningful virtual tour Orit, the floor is yours. So thank you, Jane, for this um, wonderful introduction. I hope to live up to it. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, and let's just directly jump in. It will be to uh, use our time in the best way possible. Uh, and I'm bringing up uh, the first thing is um, what you can see is, uh, in a way, uh, the map of Yad Vashem. And as we speak of Yad Vashem, um, and just to touch base, Yad Vashem's law was legislated in 1953 as a state law in the state of Israel. And when we look at its name, which is, was um, taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, verse 5, and I'd like to read to you this verse, and to them will I give in my house and within my walls a memorial and the name, which is Yad Vashem, that shall not be cut off. 
And the whole mission of Yad Vashem is to strive to achieve that. Now, when we speak of Yad Vashem's um, campus, one of the things that I hope also to pass through our tour, Yad Vashem is like a quilt of memories. And in that meaning, it reflects the way the Israeli society throughout the last seven decades, a little more than seven decades, um, has been perceiving the Holocaust and according to that, commemorating it. And therefore, each piece, each part of Yad Vashem campus opens to us the history and the thought of commemoration, as well as which issues Israeli society was dealing with throughout these seven decades. And we're starting our first um, uh, tour, we're, our first stop in our tour. We're going to start with the Hall of Remembrance, but just one word maybe also before that. If you want, if we're speaking about Israeli collective memory, and Yad Vashem is the study case of that, um, it's important to uh, point out that actually, if we want to understand this shaping of memory, the first um, decades were dedicated at Yad Vashem for research mostly and for um, documentation. Only around the 70s can we start to find the commemoration in a more vast phenomena, and we'll see that expressed through our tour. And from the 90s, we will see also the um, receiving or the uh, manifestation of the programma of the new historical museum, which was opened in 2005, which is already not so new, but all relatively, as well as um, centering the issue of education by um, Avnel Shalev, who uh, just um, uh, finished his uh, very long credential as Yad Vashem's chairman. And I'd like to bring you, therefore, to this place, uh, which is the Hall of Remembrance, but in order that we'll, in order that we'll see it much better, um, you can see it over here. And this place was the first place of commemoration that was erected at Yad Vashem. And it's at the highest point of Yad Vashem. And what, and it was um, open to public on the uh, Hebrew month of Nisan um, in the spring of 1961. In order to understand what was the need that it commemorates, I would like to share it with you over here um, with what we can see uh, in this place. And as we enter the Hall of Remembrance, you can see that on the ground, we have approximately 22 names of uh, mass killing sites, main uh, concentration and death camps, which were known at the time. Among them, you can see here Babi Yao, which was the main murder site of Kiev Jewry, Ponare uh, of the Vilnius Jews in Lithuania. Um, you probably can um, uh, find names that you are more familiar with. And then the other and those that also with uh, shows us something about commemoration, for example, Yasenovats, which is less a canonic known camp, but a very um, harsh uh, extermination camp which existed in Croatia. Um, Terezinstadt ghetto, um, Stutthof concentration camp and so on. In this place, you can also see something else. And at the far end, you can see this place where you have on one hand the eternal flame, according to the Jewish custom to uh, light a candle on the anniversary of death of someone who passed away. Here is we're speaking of a systematical murder for at least three and a half years. Um, this eternal flame is constantly lit. Before that, in front of it, you can see this um, triangular, cement triangular, and beneath it is um, ashes which was brought uh, from the extermination camps. As this place, in a way, functions as a semi-cemetery, um, as there is no place for those who want to come and mourn. The family members they have lost, they have no place to do so, because nothing was left. And so in a way, even though Yad Vashem is not an authentic site, the first place of erection, which was so important for commemoration, was the Hall of Remembrance in the meaning of having a place for identification, a ceremonial place, a place to remember. That was the first thing which was important. And again, the date is 1961. One of the things that we can see also 
looking at this place is the fact that this is a very collective memory. The first phase of commemoration was a very collective memory, speaking of the six million, and again, six million is becoming a symbol, symbolic number. Um, if we speak today of how many victims are we uh, speaking of of the Holocaust, it varies between 5.3 to 5.78 million um, uh, Jews. Um, and some even speak of more than 6 million, depending on till when do you count um, the victims from also the aftermath of the Holocaust. And one of the things that it shows us, it's maybe because it was so close to the people. People lost their family members, their close ones. They, the first thing they wanted is again to have a ceremonial place, but a place of a collective memory. With time, um, every delegation, official delegation that visits the state of Israel comes to this place and lays wreath on the uh, place of ashes, which was brought, as well as kindling the eternal flame. And ceremonies take place here. Here also, the first uh, Pope who visited Yad Vashem, John Paul II, came here in 2000. And it shows us how also the recognition by different countries as they visit the state of Israel, understanding how fundamental the Holocaust is in the Israeli identity as well as in the Jewish identity. And I'm saying Israeli identity and not merely Jewish identity, as we're speaking of a diverse society in Israel, of majority of Jews, but not merely, but the presence of the Holocaust is there for all groups. Um, in this place, one of the also very important uh, issues is that you can see also how it is constructed. You can see it here from within, and I'll take you back to the exterior, and you can see how we, we can speak of a symbolic architecture. As we have the symbolic cement pressing over the volcano um, uh, stones, resembling, symbolizing the thousands of years Jewish life which existed, and the cement can present, represent also the Nazi regime uh, press, oppressing um, the Jews during this period of time. This was also the first time that a square over here was assembled for a, a ceremonies for the public. And only from this point on, we will find ceremonies taking place at Yad Vashem, again, from 1961. So this is the first place which is very important. And another thing that is important remembering regarding that, as we said, it's at the highest point of Yad Vashem. And even after that, when the campus will expand with time and even with um, the establishment of the new historical museum in 2005, it will be an important component to maintain that the place of identification and ceremonies will remain at the highest point of the mountain of remembrance of Yad Vashem. So this is uh, our introduction. But from there, also Israeli society had to face different experiences. Among them are the different wars. If we speak of, first of all, the War of Independence in 1948, but following with that, Israeli society at the beginning had many accusations towards the survivors. We hear many people speaking of a very specific image of whose story should be told and who shouldn't or should be less told. It's not that the survivors today, today we know to say didn't speak, but there were those who didn't want to speak and there were those who did not want to listen. So from one hand, on a state level, there was legislation for commemoration of the Holocaust. On the other hand, and the individual level, it varied. But there was a feeling also from one hand among some of the survivors that their story shouldn't be told because it's a story of victimization. So they didn't speak. But there was also in part of the narration, a very specific group was centered in this for those who were last week also on Noam's tour. And that was the whole issue of heroism and resistance. And to speak of the monument that you see here, 
just to show you the place of reference, and for a moment I'll stop sharing and I'll reshare um, the image. Uh, for those of you who are acquainted and for those who aren't, you can see over here the original monument designed by Nathan Rappaport. Um, and you can see it over here placed in Warsaw in Moranov district, which was the Jewish district, right next to where the Judenrat, the Jewish leadership in the ghetto, in Warsaw ghetto uh, building was. And you can see something that is important because you have the monument when the place was, when it was established on the date of the uprising of Warsaw ghetto on April 19th, 1948. And you can see all the rumbles and the runes and the fact that Warsaw was destroyed and how it stood out. And you could see it also over here today, but you can see something very important. In the initial establishment of the monument, you can see it was of two sides. It was a very dichotomic representation. Or you were part of this group and you can see how they are presented in the matter of all like Greek gods, uh, monumental, very well built, all looking directly um, forward or up, and having here also the menorahs from Klomatska synagogue in that way. This is again the original monument in um, Warsaw. And at the back were those who were perceived as those who went as sheep to the slaughter the deportation of Warsaw Jewry to their death in the extermination camp, mostly of Treblinka. Now I'd like to bring you back, therefore, to the monument at Yad Vashem, because the monument at Yad Vashem was, was established on the base of the same, uh, the same monument of um, uh, Nathan Rapoport with the same cast, a plaster cast, but there was a very important change made. And you can see it over here. This was already done by the chairman of that time, um, Itzhak Arad, who was himself a uh, teenager survivor of the Holocaust, a partisan, um, also led, uh, was in a very, was a general in the Israeli uh, Defense Force in the state of Israel. And he came and made this change in the understanding that you already by 1975, 1976, and it was placed in two phases, first this phase, and then the second, something has changed. Now let us try and understand when we say something has changed, what has changed here. Between the establishment of Yad Vashem and 1975, we can see a few turning points which are fundamental to the way Israeli society has looked upon the Holocaust. The first was 1961 with Eichmann trial. For the first time with the uh, bringing to uh, justice, Adolf Eichmann, um, who was in charge of the deportations of the Jews, of or the whole uh, operation of the deportation of the Jews from throughout Europe to the different extermination camps. As he was brought from Argentina to Israel, and his trial opened in April, 1961. For the first time, survivors were brought to the stand. For the first time, people heard the story as a whole. For the first time, this depiction of this trial, which is very important, was, as we'll use, Ben Gurion, who was then the prime minister of the state of Israel, said, to educate the people to know the story of the Holocaust as a whole. And in looking at that, understanding for the first time, starting to understand, it's not fully in comprehension, comprehending, but to start to understand the situation. It was a very difficult place for many Israelis at the time, because during the British mandate, before the establishment of the State of Israel, there were here three different undergrounds. Later on, you have the Israeli Defense Force fighting the different wars. And so the feeling is that you should use arms in order to act to and not to go using um, already the coin term from the time of the Holocaust as sheep to the slaughter. Just to exemplify that, one of the people who will become a general in the IDF, who was a child survivor himself, his name was Yossi Pelled. His original name was Jeff Mendelevich. 
and he wrote his um, memoir only in the early 90s. And one of the things that he wrote was the following in his uh, conclusion, conclusion of his book. He said, I had to invent, I was living in a kibbutz down south of Israel, and I had to invent a story. My mother was with me, but she spoke Yiddish. She spoke the language from there. Who wanted any connection? So I adopted a very Israeli name, not Jefke, which, which is a name from there, but Yossi, very Israeli name. And not only that, I couldn't say he was already, already he was originally from Belgium. I couldn't say that I was a uh, uh, child survivor that my father perished in Auschwitz. So I invented the story. My father fought with Mordechai Nilevich in the uprising of Warsaw Ghetto and died there. And there, my father was a hero, like the fathers of all the children in the kibbutz who fell in battle fighting for the state of Israel. And so Eichmann Schraub for the first time enabled an opening of exception of this narration. Moving forward through the Six Day War in June 1967, when there was a feeling just before the war that in a moment, the state of Israel will cease to exist before war will start. Following also with the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement War in 1973, when the first days of this war, when the state of Israel was caught in surprise, had great casualties of soldiers, and the end won, but still this opened for the first time, this enabled this process that you see the outcome here in this monument. And you can see another change in the depiction. And this is the verse from the book of Ezekiel, of Ezekiel chapter um, 16, uh, verse um, uh, six, that says here, and when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thin own blood, I said unto thee, when thee wast in the blood, live. I said unto thee, wast in the blood, live, saying, and this is why it was important to bring this verse here, that only from this situation, and this is an understanding that had to be developed, only from the situation of the deportations to the extermination camps, could people rise for an uprising. And from that moment, from this, the middle of the 70s, this will become the new um, assembly square for the annual ceremony every Holocaust Remembrance Day in the um, uh, Israeli calendar, which is the 27th of the Hebrew month, Nisan, which changes in the general dates between um, May, April, and May, depending where it falls every year. And this is something that is very important, facing this monument. I'd like to raise a question as to, uh, to you, just to think over, to ponder on, today, in 2021, more years have passed. Should we add something else to this monument as it that doesn't depict anymore just this situation? As today we have stepped even further on in the understanding, in our um, concept of what was the Holocaust? Who, how, think how much we're longing today to speak to survivors, to meet survivors as they are sadly passing away as time is taking its course. Maybe we need to add here something else. Now, I'm leaving this open, but one of the things that is very strong in the Ad Vashem campus that I would like to stress here as well, as we're speaking of a quilt of memories, the concept is never, not, never is something reducted, but always just added. So maybe we need a new monument today. This is maybe a different question or in 10 years from now. But this is something to definitely think of as we're speaking about the depiction of memory and also how in that way the Israeli society perceives and understands the Holocaust throughout the different decades. And as we are saying that and we're speaking about heroes and I'm bringing you back to the map because we're going to move on now to 10 years forward, to, sorry, to a place which is over here, but in order to see it better, 
I'm going to open it here. And I'd like you to see, to look at this monument because it has a couple of components. And the place where you stand is crucial that you don't miss out any of, any of the factors of this monument. This monument is dedicated to the Jews who fought among the partisans and the allied armies against Nazi Germany. It was established in 1985, designed by Bernie Fink, and it's dedicated to the million and a half Jews who fought in the different armies against Nazi Germany and partisans. Now let's look first at the monument and then understand what is the importance of it and which other, another phase of depiction it represents for us. So you can see here, as we come closer, we can see six massive stones, which create the shape of the Star of David. The void is crucial for the understanding because the void is the void that is also made because of the loss of the six million. But you have the spear cutting through, representing the resistance. For those of you who are acquainted with the IDF symbol, this is very much a paraphrase, paraphrase on this, on the symbol of the IDF. And it's not a coincidence because if you want to speak of arms, of resistance, it's, you want to connect it to the locality, to the Israel society, this is the best place to do that. Now, who are those who fought? If you look at the bottom over here, look at the stairs, it creates the shape of a menorah. And this is why the place of standing, watching the, the, the uh, monument is important because here are the uh, grounds of the menorah. Here is the main uh, part of it. And I'm bringing you now back to the stairs and you'll be able to see the place where you have usually the candles. So this represents the Jewish identity of these soldiers. Why is this such change, such a change in the perceivement of the Israeli society? When we speak about a million and a half Jews who fought among partisans, but mostly among the different armies against Nazi Germany, there was one group of half a million soldiers that for years in the Israeli society was silenced. And not only in the Israeli society, but in all the Western world, their story was hardly told. And these are half a million Jews who fought in the Soviet army. Why wasn't their story hardly told? For a very simple reason. Once World War II ends, the Cold War starts. And so the depiction, and if you open history books, 40 years back in time, 50 years back in time, if you will conduct a survey at that time, who liberated Auschwitz? Automatically, the answer was the Americans or British. The Soviets were very much reduced in their role in World War II because of the Cold War, which opened right with the end of World War II. Half a million Jews fought in the Soviet army. Now, if we think of that, what was their motivation? Now, of course, in such a totalitarian regime, it wasn't a choice if you want to enlist or not. But half a million people, 300,000 of them, lived to see the day of liberation, 200,000 of them died in battle or in DP camp or in a POW camps. 300,000 this way survived. And for many, as they speak of their motivation, they speak of their Jewish identity as well as they leave their family behind in those territories who are, which are occupied by Nazi Germany. And understanding the first phase once invading uh, the Soviet Union. The initial point of starting with mass murder and only then in some, in the, in the uh, minority of places, establishing ghettos, this was part of their story as well. We have documentation of these soldiers and one of them, I'd like to read to you one of their letters. The way we have the letters is because um, one of the main publicists, writers, which was, of, uh, which was Jewish, living in the Soviet Union, was a person by the name of Ehrenburg. And he uh, had many soldiers, Jewish soldiers, writing to him. And I'd like to read to you one of these letters. 
And this is what uh, he wrote. And I'm reading it out loud. I am a Jew, a student. My nation has thousands of years of history. For thousands of years, our exiled nation form its country suffered from persecutions and humiliations. We who gave the world the Torah, Christianity, Marx, our ideas which improved the whole human world, we were always called dirty jid. There's nothing more tragic than my people's fate. From the other side of the front, we were killed and burned. Babi Yar, Maidanek, Auschwitz, seven million murdered Jews. We didn't face the question for whom to fight in this battle. We couldn't take comfort that others' nations' blood will calm the beast and will save us. We knew that the Germans' victory is our death. We fought mercilessly of those, who faith, of those whose fate has been sentenced. But also on this side of the front, among our lines, we weren't people, but Gigi. To be persecuted by the enemy is very difficult. But when there are your friends, this it's beyond the human abilities. It is loneliness. This is the fate of our people. And saying that, this presents to us also how when we speak of the, the uh, loneliness, and but a different also narration, not a day of a catastrophe, a victimization, but the day of victory. In Israeli society, mostly we are exposed to this issue with, of course, the disentanglement of the communist bloc and the huge wave of immigration from the former Soviet Union territories to the state of Israel in the early 90s. Today, more than a million of its citizens are from the former Soviet Union territories. And the day that they commemorate is May 9th commemorating the day of victory when Germany surrendered. And when we speak of that date, this is why this date for many years, therefore, was commemorated in, in front of this monument, conducting on May 9th a ceremony. Today it's done in Natrun at the outskirts, uh, um, uh, just out of uh, Jerusalem. But this ceremony where you see, where you see all those veterans arriving with all their medals, very proud of the role that they took in World War II, fighting for the liberation of these territories for also Jews in that way, connecting to their families. And it took many years for Israeli society to acknowledge that. This monument in 1985, already we're speaking of the late days of the communist bloc, and therefore, um, it's dedicated for all those who fought. But if you think of it, the Soviet front was the only one who was the whole time in Europe. In Europe. And therefore their role in World War II in combating Nazi Germany was crucial in that way. And today, we, if we're speaking of Israel society, we don't have a group of youngsters that arrives or of soldiers that you don't have at least a few that this is their narration, this is their history, and this is the place where they can feel connected when the story is told. And this is bringing us to our next stop. As we're speaking of, um, and I'm bringing you back to the campus, we spoke of, from one hand, from a very collective memory. We can see here some polarization of the memory, starting to acknowledge different groups we spoke about different changes, and another very important change that will take place is the change of government in the state of Israel in 1977. For the first time, the right uh, party will take um, the government, um, will be in government. And if only from 1980, it will become obligatory to teach about the Holocaust for matriculation in the Israeli system, which shows you maybe something very surprising. We would have expected if the Holocaust is so present in the Israeli society since so many were descendants and uh, or part of survivors' families. How come only in 1980? Because it takes a long time to be open, to accept, and to acknowledge the importance of it. And so only from 1980, this becomes 
obligatory. The next change is connected, not in the place in the course of just speaking of which groups are we talking about, but how do we commemorate? Because still then still, we're speaking of groups, we're speaking of a collective memory. And our turning point is connected to, one second, to our place over here, and it'll bring us closer, and this is the Children's Memorial. The Children's Memorial was also established under the convention of Yitzhak Arad. And this is something very important because Yitzhak Arad, as we said, he was a youngster, he was a, a young teenager with the outbreak of the war. We're speaking of about a 13, 14 year old boy who joined the partisans. And he understood the importance, if you speak about the Holocaust, one fourth of the victims of the Holocaust were children. A million and a half of the victims of the Holocaust were children. And therefore, they should have their own commemoration place. And this was combined with also um, and, uh, uh, the willing of those to contribute money to erect this monument that had their own personal story and will tell their story in a second. But first, I'd like you to look at how this place is comprised. Because the monument is combined of an exterior part, and later on we'll walk in. And the part from the outside that you can see, you can see here, and we're from afar, you can see here, one second, um, you can see here the uh, pillars standing up here on the hill. These pillars, are organized as if children are standing in a class photo, which is the most normal um, thing that happens annually in a child's life. But these pillars are all cut off to represent the cutting abruptly of children's lives. The use of white marble is also important because white represents innocence. The only sin of these children was that they were Jews. But the white marble also represents the matzeva, the tombstone. So in a way, we're speaking also of a stone of commemoration, of the customary stone of commemoration, as we know it from the cem different cemeteries. And when we look through, we start from this assembly square to represent the normal life where children came from. And from there, as we walk through, one of the things that we can see is that we have this alley taking us through. Abraham and Edita Spiegel, who donated the money for this uh, monument, were a, a Hungarian Jewish couple who were deported to Auschwitz in the summer of 1944 with their young son, their two-year-old son, Uziel. With the selection taking place, their son was taken from them and was sent to be directly murdered in the gas chambers. This is the only place where you have Uziel as an individual commemorated here. The rest of the commemoration as we're going to see as we enter is dedicated to the million and a half of children, but still in an individualized way. And I'll say about that in a second one thing. Please look at this fragment of Uziel. I hope you can see that the eyes are hollow. Many times we say that the eyes are the window to the soul. Here the eyes are hollow because he was murdered. Avraham and Edith Spiegel managed to survive, reunite, immigrated to the United States, but wanted to commemorate their son's memory. And with the initiative of Yitzhak Arad, this memorial was comprised. The architect of this memorial is a Moshe Safdi, that his uh, print is known throughout different memorials at Yad Vashem, including also in the historical museum, which was opened in 2005. And the way of commemoration as we're going to enter, and then I'll be quiet, so I hope you'll be able to hear a little of the sounds from within. In order to individualize, approximately 1,000 names are read in three languages. Hebrew, Yiddish, and English. 
Hebrew, as we're speaking of the language in the state of Israel, Yiddish as a language that was the language of many of the victims, and English for those who do not speak these two languages in order to mediate um, the names. You will, I hope you'll be able to hear well the names each time a name is recited, the age the child has perished, and where he was from. The place is constructed that it's all dark. There are five candles, real candles in the middle, and the endless reflection will create as if there are a million and a half candles lit. Let us look how it is presented. Hopefully the uh, experience will be transparent and then I'll say a few words about this. This place was open in 1985. And as we're walking through, and we'll try to listen to the names, try to think what also this reminds you of. What does it look like, this endless reflection? Leonia Dave, one year old, Ukraine. Sarah Zemchevs. Five years old. The age of the children is up to um, age 18 when they are considered adults. Um, I hope you were able to hear a few of the names of the one year old of Sarah who was five years old, and each time you can hear also the uh, place they were from. Looking at this depiction, it could it might also remind us not only the endless reflection of candles but also stars in the sky if you think of the oath god gave abraham that his future generations will be countless as the sand by the sea and the stars in the sky this is exactly the contradiction of that oath as stars are being taken down one by one as children, the future generation are being murdered, a million and a half children. And looking at this, one of the things that we can see is to what extreme measures the Holocaust was that specifically the children were chosen to be murdered as they were the future generation. And if you want to erase the future generation, the whole nation, you need to attack first those who are the future. And when we look at this um, re representation of this uh, children's memorial, we find one of the children also um, leaving, as we leave, I'll rephrase, as we leave this monument, one of the things that is very strong is that you come out from the darkness into the light. Even in the winter times, in contrast to Europe and to the States, the sun is very present in Israel. And even when it's, uh, when it's winter, you're striking by the, by the light as you come out from the darkness into the light. A very important message that was many times throughout different memorials here at Yad Vashem. One of the children who was sure that she would perish wrote her testimony on June 23rd, 1943. Her name was Dunya Rosen. She was sure she will not survive. Um, she did survive, by the way, in the forest, 
uh, came here to Israel, was the head of the um, Righteous Among the Nations Department at Yad Vashem, uh, later on also continued to work at the archive in order to uh, document the stories. But this is what she wrote when she was 12 years old, sure that she will not survive. F words fail me, but I must write, I must. So when the years will pass, my, world, my words will bring, it, will bring me back to you. I'd like to ask you not to forget the dead. I'm begging you with every request that you take vengeance of our death. I want you to erect for us, for us a monument that will reach the sky, a mark that will be seen by the whole world, not a statue, not of marble, and not of stone, but of good deeds because I believe in great faith that only such a stone will ensure you and your children a better future. And then the evil that once existed will not be able to take over the world again and to turn life into hell. And th her, this understanding of hers um, maybe shows us, connects also to many of what if the children would have passed on this would be part of the words, and we can find part of their words in this way um, through their journals of those which remain. It is very important, therefore, that individ individualization of the memory that we can see here, from the very collective memory that we saw at the first place of the Hall of Remembrance, the first place erected the Yad Vashem, 1985, for the first time you see an individualized memory but of a group. And this is why um, the place, which is right outside of the Children's Memorial, is already dedicated also to one person. It was established more or less at the same time. And this is the monument dedicated to Janusz Kolchak and the children. And you can see it over here, okay? It's enlarged, so this is why I'm scrolling through. And yeah, and this uh, 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 monument was established, uh, was supposed to be opened for the 100th anniversary of Janusz Kolchak. He was born in 1878. And so this was supposed to be opened, established for 1978. But it took a little longer and therefore it was opened um, uh, uh, in the eighties. It was done by uh, Baruch Skeziak. And the question is, why Janusz Kolchak? Why, when you, for the first time, you find one person commemorated? Why is it Janusz Kolchak? And you can see through this uh, monument, the story of Janusz Kolchak, that Janusz Kolchak, who was born to the name Henrik Goldschmidt, a doctor, but also a person who made the revolution, educational revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, for the first time saying children are equal to the adults. The only difference between children and adults that the adults were born before the children. One third of the wealth of the world should belong to the children. But what can you do? Children do not know that. And even if they do claim it, who would listen to them? And there, therefore he established two children's orphanages in Warsaw, one for Polish children and one for Jewish children. And there, it was the children's kingdom. They had their own court. The children's convention that you might be acquainted with from 1987 is based on the convention of children, the children's convention, which was formed by Janusz Kocha, the right, the, children, the, uh, the right of the child for respect, the right of the child for love. Very, very fundamental rights that today we take for granted, at this time, weren't even acknowledged in any way. And Kolchak saw their importance. You can see how he's also therefore presented almost at the same height of the children, to say that he never patronized them. He was even sent, sentenced by them a couple of times with different penalties because of his decisions in order to uh, be an example 
to the way that he thought the orphanage should be uh, organized. Every child who, who arrived to the orphanage was asked three questions by Kocha. Who are you? What do you bring with you? And the third was, what can I do for you? Janusz Kolczak, once the, uh, with the outbreak of World War II, the establishment of Warsaw Ghetto, moved with the Jewish orphanage into the ghetto, moved a couple of times within the territories of the ghetto. And you can see how you can, his hand here represents his uh, will or his uh, hope to be able to take care of the children. But you can see also how it's cut and how it has been, it went through different difficult times. And you can see how the children here are based within the cement. We have here 12 children representing the 12 tribes of Israel. But um, we know that there were approximately 200 children in his orphanage. On August 5th, 1942, during the uh, deportation, the mass deportation of Warsaw Ghetto Jewry to Treblinka, the orphanage was doomed to be as well deported. He had the possibility not to join the children as he was very famous due to his writings. And he chose to go with the children to their, to their death. And they all perished in Treblinka. Again, why is Kolchak the one who is commemorated here? There were many other educators who went with their children to death, to their death. But Kolchak, who was famous before the Holocaust, who made such a revolution in education, therefore his story was much what stood up, stood up. And this was something, and this is why his story in this way is the one to be commemorated. And the, his influence on our world till today, with his understanding of the rights of children and which kind of education should be formed, is the reason why he is the one to be commemorated here. And every year on the 5th of August, there is a commemorational commemoration ceremony taking place here by youth, by uh, members of youth organizations and youth movements, uh, and just to show and to pass on his legacy to the youngsters. And again, this shows you how it is very strong, very much embedded in the Israeli society in that way to the extent that sometimes, and this is not only in Israel, when people are asked, what is, what do they know about, uh, about uh, Janusz Kolczak? Many think that he's a righteous among the nation because of his name, but his influence is known. I am going to end with one last sentence and then if, uh, for time for questions, if there are. One of the children who lived in Mogilev, in Transnistria, um, Romanian territory. His name was Eliezer Genvergel. He very much looked up to his educator ed and uh, he wrote in his educator's um, journal the following quote, the memory is the only paradise where a man cannot be expelled from. And the whole concept, as you can see, the development of shaping of memory at Yad Vashem is that today the individual is very much centered. And for those of you who have been and those who haven't, and we uh, invite you to come and visit our historical museum, today this is what is centered in that, in the historical museum. You have, from one hand, the large story. On the other hand, you have many personal individual stories because we cannot also grasp the story of the six million without bringing the stories of the individuals. This is one of the changes. And the second, as we said, the purpose of Yad Vashem is a memorial in the name. We're trying to bring in the stories of as many people as possible. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer. All right, thank you so much. Um, there've been many comments saying how much you've moved them. And, uh, and even though, uh, it's hard to do our campus and our museum and our pedagogical philosophy justice on Zoom, but I think you've really managed to do that and capture that in this past hour. Um, 
as a result though it's because you've been talking so fantastically and everyone's been listening it's now nine o'clock so we will be saying goodbye now and um, please come and visit us as soon as the skies reopen and thank you for your support thank you Oric so much wonderful presentation thank you and I wish you all a wonderful day evening night wherever which zone you are in